is a national NIL law. And I do think that uh, there's potential for them to start to gain some traction in that space. Nothing's happened, and they've been going to Capitol Hill for three years now, asking for uh, something to resolve this area uh, and haven't been able to get any, any meaningful movement on it. Uh, Charlie Baker, uh, former governor of Massachusetts, now president of the NCA, he's trying to reframe uh, the issue of a national NIL bill as a consumer protection issue. He's arguing that student athletes uh, and their families are being uh, taken advantage of by uh, collect, uh, uh, collectives and brands that have an advantage over them. And we need to level the playing field with a uniform NIL contract and, and other forms of protection for uh, student athletes that, and their families that reside in the states that you govern. So uh, we'll see if that uh, helps move the needle at all on the NIL issue. Uh, two other areas that the NCAA has asked for is a law that would declare student athletes to be non-employees and a limited antitrust exemption. I don't see Congress doing anything on these two issues. Uh, I'm, I'm not expecting much movement, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, a couple of thoughts that I wanna share with you uh, having to do with what should the NCAA have learned from the last 20 years dealing with uh, uh, the name, image, and likeness test cases presented by uh, 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 Jeremy Bloom, Donald De La Haye, and Ed, Ed O'Bannon. Uh, the NCAA is in the position it's in now, scrambling uh, for relevancy because they just kept fighting against uh, some more progressive form of amateurism and ultimately had it forced upon them. And so, uh, I, you know, as I think back, what if the NCAA, when Jeremy Bloom presented this unique set of circumstances, what if they had started the dialogue? What if they had said, you know, let's start talking about what rules would look like uh, that we could pass, that we could be in control of before uh, lawmakers or courts step in and resolve it for us? Could they have created some uniform NCAA uh, rules that they would be responsible for? Could they have avoided uh, some of the lawsuits that came down in the past 20 years uh, that, that really put the NCAA in a, uh, in a bad position trying to defend uh, its views on amateurism? Uh, I would also, in, in this, with this idea of trying to get ahead of the next big issues to come along, uh, I, would, I would hope that the NCA would recognize that, uh, they, that as times are changing, what they've historically relied upon uh, in, in terms of the courts having protected their version of amateurism has gone away and they, they can't rely on the courts to side with them any longer. And I think they've come to that realization after the Alston case uh, and the nine nothing defeat that they experienced in the Supreme Court there. Um, but the next big issue that I would encourage the NCAA to get out ahead on is this challenge of uh, student athletes uh, asking to be defined legally as employees. And they're using different strategies, uh, uh, working through the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, we've got plaintiffs uh, using the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, to challenge uh, the, the fact that they've always been labeled as non-employees. And uh, my recommendation, not that the NCA is looking for it uh, or is gonna do anything uh, related to this, but what I'd really love to see is uh, for the NCAA to engage in some form of dialogue uh, that might look like collective bargaining with their athletes uh, to, in much the same way that the NBA does with their Players Association, NFL, Major League Baseball, sit down around the table with their athletes, help them understand uh, what the legal and economic challenges would be 
to uh, uh, paying you something above and beyond uh, your scholarship. Uh, but if, if there's anything that we should have learned from the skier, the kicker, and the avatar, it's that fighting against uh, uh, certain change and having it forced upon them uh, down the line is only going to lead to uh, more pain and challenges for the NCAA and uh, potentially uh, lead to the organization uh, no longer existing. Uh, we'll have to see. I, I, I know that there are many challenges that, to doing the things that I recommend, and part of that is the hundreds of different schools and administrators and conferences that uh, just want to keep fighting this fight uh, that, that student athletes cannot be employees in their minds. Uh, with that, uh, I'd love to continue the dialogue if there are any questions. I know we don't have a lot of time remaining, but uh, appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. Any questions? Awesome. Yeah. Um, talk about collectives. I find it's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, these groups of businesses that are uh, sometimes paying athletes just, like, it's, like you said, a base salary. Mm -hmm. I know it's a big deal when, like, the Swarm got Kirk Frentz to kind of give a personal endorsement and, like, telling football boosters, hey, maybe you should start donating here instead. Mm -hmm. I know that's a big deal across many collectives, coach endorsements for both football and, and uh, basketball specifically, is that not considered like the school endorsing um, these collectives when they're getting their coaches to do it? Yeah, th th that's like up to the line, you know, so so there is a line there, you know, you wouldn't, uh, Coach Ferentz wouldn't be able to uh, to bring a student athlete on his recruiting visit and introduce him to the, the head of Swarm and say, hey, I think, you know, this would be a perfect relationship uh, here. So uh, they, they, Iowa actually uh, takes a pretty conservative approach to supporting its collective, uh, as you're probably well aware. Uh, and, and actually the head of the collective, uh, the Swarm collective, has been uh, openly critical in the news media of the Iowa Athletics Department. Um, when, I, when I say that, it's about uh, some collectives are getting support from their athletics department, like in the form of uh, the athletics department giving the collective their season ticket holder list and, in order to reach out to, uh, allowing the collective to set up uh, 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 information tables and booths right on the concourse in the stadium or just having a larger presence uh, that feels more within the team but not running the collective so very perceptive question yeah okay. yeah if you if we did go towards something like collective bargaining with student athletes do you see that as something that would start out you know as a as a low baseline, whether it's 20,000 a year or something like that, or do you see it moving in a direction like towards revenue sharing or actually getting like a piece of the pie? Yeah, you know, that's why uh, my, it, in my uh, imaginary world, I think of, you know, if you get football and basketball student athletes who arguably could say, look, you know, I'm worth $500,000, you know, pick your great, football or basketball student athlete. But if you get them around the table with their fellow student athletes in gymnastics or track and field or swimming and diving, and you, you educate them on, you know, Title IX is still a federal law that as a university we uh, must comply with, whether you agree with it or not. And so once you understand some of the economic and legal issues that, that we would face, uh, what would be reasonable? You know, let's accept the fact that the starting quarterback at Clemson isn't going to get paid what he's worth, but uh, if it allows us to uh, give you more than you're currently receiving uh, and sustains college athletics uh, legally under Title IX and other laws, then isn't that better for everyone? And I, I feel like there's, there's a middle ground there that... Uh, would satisfy large numbers of student athletes, 
also uh, would, you know, going back to this idea of fighting back against public perception, it would help the public recognize that, okay, the NCA is, is making uh, legitimate steps towards the middle. Uh, all they've ever seen the NCA do is say, we know what's best, uh, don't question it, uh, we can't afford to pay you, and you know, if, you, if you got a dollar more than uh, uh, what your scholarship calls for, the whole system would crumble. And uh, the NCA has got to get beyond that narrative. Uh, that's a losing narrative, and uh, whether it's next year or 10 years from now, uh, they're going to end up with employees and having to figure out now how do we deal with this. I was just wondering what's stopping these conferences from just breaking away from the NCAA? It seems like the SEC and the Big Ten like, have the desire to pay their athletes and do all these things, but they're just not because this figure is telling them not to. Why aren't they just leaving? Well, you know, they need to know what they'd be leaving for. And, you know, yeah, they, they could maybe play lots of great games between the, the Big Ten and the, the SEC, but there is some probably some perceived value to uh, all of these teams across the country. We're, we're part of this uh, very large college athletics ecosystem that gives us access to this uh, tournament that everybody's watching you know, this month, and, and uh, uh, not that they couldn't just take football and move outside, because that has been proposed. Uh, there, there has been discussion about, you know, does football end up moving outside of the NCAA? Football at the highest level of Division I um, and just break off and become something of its own and then all other sports continue to be administered by the NCAA. There, there's, it's still too early to know, uh, but it's, it's not impossible that they will end up somewhere close to what you're thinking about. Uh, there could become a fourth division, uh, you know, a division of division one that becomes a new division where there are much greater benefits to student athletes and maybe it's only 65 teams or uh, some smaller number. Uh, not all of division one wants to go in that direction. Um, so wait and see. I don't think it's that far-fetched that uh, but it probably wouldn't become like the Big Ten going out and just becoming a barnstorming league. Uh, that's got to, they still want to set up a, a meaningful schedule with teams around the country. So we are unfortunately out of time. So <laughs> <laughs>